folks, this is an odd video. I am still in the midst of finishing up the Valdor Tank Hunter, but like most modelers, I, I never just have one project going on at a time. Um, I've been taking commission model work for oh, probably, let's see, it's 2020. So yeah, uh, almost, wow almost 20 years I've been I've been doing that I know that there are there are some amazing modelers that actually get paid they make a full-time living um, building models for sale and and you know doing commission work and making ridiculous amounts I am um, proud and humbled and fortunate enough to say that I have uh, built models that are in museums, actually in museums. Um, I have had uh, a couple aircraft on display at the USS Intrepid, the um, aircraft carrier turned museum in New York City. I think I still have um, two or three pieces on display at, at the Frontiers of Flight Museum in Dallas right now, which is really cool, in the Fort, Dallas-Fort Worth area, uh, and a few other places. Um, but I, you know, primarily when I sell models, they go to private collectors. And, you know, that's awesome. Um, I, you know, I'm, I'm thrilled beyond belief that people enjoy my work enough that they're willing to pay for it. What an awesome thing. Uh, I could never make a living doing it, though. You know, like, it's not that kind of thing for me. Not at all. Um, but I've been doing it a long time. And a lot of people will say in any business the customer is always right. And the video that we're doing right now is, is a thing where, you know what? The customer is always entitled to their wants, desires, and opinions. But sometimes the customer is not always right. Because the customer obviously dictates what they want. But sometimes the customer has to yield to the, the knowledge of experience. And that's what this video is about. And this video is about uh, a project gone, gone bad, and 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 turned good, but it, it's about the perils of of doing a commission work. Um, it, it's about the you know having just enough knowledge to be dangerous. Uh, something we say in the military, and it's it's kind of a cautionary tale. So what you're looking at in front of you right now is the finished work of what was a commission project. It is an F-16C from the Air Force 64th Aggressors Squadron. It's a paint scheme. I know you can't see the whole thing right now because of the lighting, but you'll see everything. A paint scheme they call Shark. It's a made to replicate uh, the paint scheme on uh, late model Su-34 fullbacks and the Su-35 Super Flanker. Um, it's a uh, dark gray over a over a sky blue scheme. The model we've used to build it is arguably one of the worst F-16 models that you can use. It is uh, Italeri's model 0840. Um, let me show you exactly the kit that this comes from. So here we are looking at the box art for the Italeri Kit 840 F-16C. And the whole saga of this build starts with a, a commission, like we said, and a customer-supplied kit. And the customer was adamant that we were going to use this kit because he got such an amazing deal on this kit, and he wanted the build... To, as he wanted it as done as cheaply as possible, and he wanted it done from this kit because it was an F-16C, and we are building an F-16C. So this was a customer-supplied kit, which, of course, if you are going to commission a builder to build something and you can supply materials, kit, things like that, it is always going to be cheaper. Now, I think folks that... that that do watch this channel and, and listen to me give my tech, technical explanations understand that 
I, with my with my military experience, I am all into the details and the beeps and the squeaks. And I, I did try to explain that to do an accurate representation, there are, I mean, yes, there's an F-16C, but it goes, it goes deeper than that. It goes, it goes to the, you know, the Marianas Trench level in detail. I mean, if you want, there are blocks, there are uh, midlife upgrades, there are a lot of details. And I don't, I don't know if it was a, all a factor of, of price and, and materials, or if this customer initially just did not understand, or, or honestly, if, if he thought I was just trying to, to, to pump up price of the build. I, I really, on, I don't know what it was, but he, his position was an F-16C should be able to be built out of whatever you got. Um, and that an F-16C kit is an F-16C kit, period, dot, end of sentence. So this is the starting point, and everything kind of jumps off from here. Now, this kit that we're looking at right here, this kit was released in 1994. So this kit is 26 years old, and it has not aged well at all. At all. If, if you look online... Uh, you can find a really good review that was put out by a very, very experienced F-16 crew chief. I, I can't remember his name right now. But this, this man has worked on virtually uh, every model of F-16 from multiple nations. And he will tell you absolutely everything that is wrong with this kit. Um, every detail, every facet. With intensive work, you can build it up to be a fairly accurate early F-16C. But as it comes in, in the kit itself, it is, it is not uh, an F-16C that is, that is accurate to any specification at all. It does build up, you, you can make a, a decent, um, kind of an A model, you know, is really what it, what it is. It's an A model with some C pieces um, that you can modify a little bit. But that's, you know, what you got in the kit. Now, if we look at the pieces in the kit, so this first picture, what Italeri did was they made it kind of a turtle back. So you'll see here in the center, it's got a, a large part of the spine missing. So it, it made it easy for them to produce two seat or single seat versions. You just put the, the spine on for whichever one, but it doesn't match up very well. So you have to do some work to, to make it fit. Otherwise you have this, this step shelf that just doesn't work. If you kind of look where where the wings meet up to the, the fuselage about midway, you'll see there's a little step there that needs a little bit of sanding. Um, what this kit does come with that we didn't see again until Kinetic and Tamiya decades later, it has the static dischargers built in on, on the stabilators and the wings and the vertical that you'll see later on, which is really cool because Hasegawa put out a very nice, well-detailed F-16 kit. Uh, but they didn't include those static discharges, which is awesome. If you look in the upper left and lower left corners, you'll see the rear portions of the tail fillet for both Air Force and NATO, um, well, not NATO, but foreign user versions with different uh, features there. Uh, you've got just small mouth intake only. So if you were going to use this kit, you couldn't build a GE engine. So that means basically you could only build, if, I mean, you could only ever build a block 32 out of this um, if you were trying to build a, a C model. You could build basically a, a 25 or a 32, and that's it. There's no way you could ever build a block 40 uh, or 50 or even a 30. Um, it, well, well, we'll get to that later. You can see here some very inaccurate but early model uh, AMRAMs as well. So this picture here, this is actually from Italeri's website. And this is marketed under an F-16C kit. If you look uh, upper left and upper right, that's an F-16A tail. And you can tell it's the F-16A tail because if you look on the uh, fillet over there on the, on the base, there's no UHF antenna. And I'll, I'll show you on the real model where it is. Now, this sprue is, is basically identical to the one that comes in the kit pretty much. Uh, there's a couple extra pieces in this picture, because this is from a different kit, but I couldn't find a really good quality image of the actual parts that come in the kit. 
Uh, if you look in the lower left corner, those are pieces to build a block 15. Um, in the upper left corner, those are also for a block 15. But just minor differences um, between this sprue and the actual one that comes in the kit. The actual, you know, the fuselage piece is identical. The tail piece is, like I said, besides having that slightly longer base on the tail and the uh, little UHF aerial, is uh, that's different, but the... The nozzle, which is, by the way, inaccurate. Um, the small mouth intake is the same. The you know the engine insert is the same. The the nose, the uh, pitot tube, all that all that is is the same. The armament sprue here is kind of the same, kind of not. So what you have that is that is basically identical in this kit is um, everything from the the upper right, the 370 gallon fuel tanks, the centerline fuel tank, those uh, two early model AMRAMs, the sidewinders, and those are kind of oh, mid, mid uh, generation sidewinders. You've got those uh, early model sidewinder rails, and then you've got those mid wing pylons. Uh, those are all good to go. And then the centerline uh, pylon over there, those are all in the kit. The kit that we're working with here comes with an ALQ uh, 131 jamming pod, which is the square looking jamming pod instead of this ALQ 119. And instead of these J model sidewinders, uh, they come with a handful of uh, CBU 20 cluster bombs up there. But other than that, this sprue is virtually identical. Nice detailing on all the pylons and the rails. But they're, they're not rails that would typically be carried on a C-model F-16. Uh, these are not compatible with AMRAMs. These rails that you see here, they can only support Sidewinders. So you might see them depending on what country is flying them. But on any American F-16, um, you know, unless it's, it's used specifically to only carry Sidewinders, you probably, you probably wouldn't see them. This sprue is identical on all their kits. So... Interesting here, you see this engine nozzle off to the to the upper sort of right side? That is the engine nozzle for the GE engine. You can't have this engine unless you have the large mouth intake. So it's great to have in spares. It's inaccurate, feather count is off, but at least you have it there. The cockpit tub is so, it, it, it's like just a fictional fantasy work. Um, and you actually have in the upper left corner, the instrument panel, the uh, control panel, all that stuff it barely represents an A model. It's terrible. It's absolutely terrible. The best thing you could do with this kit is to not build this kit. But if you have this kit, you really want to try to find um, either, I don't even think anybody makes like photo etch for this, but maybe try to put a resin cockpit in it. I took another solution to this and we'll look at that a little bit later. But this sprue is identical to the one that comes in the kit. Um, so whether you're building a, you know, an A model or a C model, it doesn't matter. They just give it to you. The wheels are not quite accurate. The landing gear is nicely detailed, but there's some big problems with the landing gear as well. Here in the lower right, you can see that turtle spine. Uh, you also see uh, just above the, the turtle back spine part there, uh, you've got two different uh, extensions for the uh, vertical stabilizer because uh, a lot of allied nations put a drag chute in there. They don't have large 10,000 foot runways like we do. So they, they use a drag chute to slow the plane down, landing on smaller runways. And different countries have different models. So the kit does give you options. If you're not one of those people that needs 100% accuracy and you're not entering this kit in a competition where it's going to be pulled apart, if it's going to be sitting on a shelf and you know people are going to be looking at it from a little farther than arm's distance, you can build it into a nice looking piece um, without doing a ton of work. You have to do a little work. Um, if you're willing to put in a ton of work, you know, you can do a lot with this kit, but it, it does require some work. And then in this last picture, you've got a two piece canopy so you can mold it open or closed. Now, if you do it open, there's, there's no rigging or armatures, you know, no mechanics that would be visible inside. And uh, the problem is there's it doesn't quite you know if you want to if you want to position it closed it doesn't 
really fit well. There's a there's a gap between the rear portion and the front portion. Um, and you really got to finagle with the glue and go slowly to actually... There's a It has an overbite, we'll say. Um, and it doesn't fit all the way. There, there's a lot of problems with this kit. There really is. But it is one of the cheapest F-16 kits on the market. It is... I don't know which is worse, this or the Academy kit. Uh, you know, maybe I should build side by side in another video and do it. But so these are all the pieces you have to work with. And and we'll talk about some more of the problems with this kit as we go through this video and we talk about the process and the, the and and the, the customer and the commission and, and all the work on this thing. All right, so there's kind of the backstory um, of a little bit into the, the history of the, the commission and a little bit of dealing with a customer here. It, a look at the kit and, and some of the what goes into this kit and and things like that. We're going to talk more about both of those things as this video goes on. And what we're going to do now is we're, we're going to look at why, when building this kit, why it is the inaccuracies that go into it, where if you're not willing to put in the time to fix these problems, it's, you know, from from just afar, if you're not technical, you know, into, like I like to say, the beeps and squeaks, if you're not into the accuracy of it, if, if you're just looking for a plane that looks like an F-16, it's not so bad. But if you're someone who really wants it to look like an accurate rendition of the aircraft, there's some there's some major issues with this thing. And, uh, you know, some, some of you guys might actually right now not even notice them. You might be saying, well, I don't, I don't get it. What's wrong with it? I guarantee once I start pointing them out, you, won't, you will not be able to unsee what I'm going to show you with this kit. And we're going to start with the landing gear, with the undercarriage, um, to begin with. Um, it sits very, very squat, and I want to say tail heavy, but you can see it's it's sitting on its front gear, right? It does that. But it also sits looking like it's got a nose-up attitude, um, like there's like it's elevated a little bit towards the front. And the F-16 doesn't do that. And if you want a real good... Um, depiction of that, let me raise the plane up a little bit on a box. As you look at the plane directly on, and you know, elevated a little bit on the box and on this, this little rotary guy right here, this little lazy Susan for models, you can see what I'm talking about. This top of this vertical stabilizer is not parallel to the ground. You can see that there is, well, and this is another problem, there's a much more exaggerated curve upwards towards the rear of the canopy. But you can see how the aircraft, it has a, a much greater sweep towards the rear than a real F-16 would. Now, where the actual problem lies, I mean, look, I'm not a structural engineer, although as we start delving farther into the landing gear problem, I kind of feel like one after fixing all the issues with this. Um, but the nose on the F-16 actually takes a little downward, a slight downward angle. Um, and I think what they did on this kit was they either tried to fix that so that the nose um, is horizontal to the ground, parallel to the ground, or, or something like that. I, but there's there's definitely um, an issue with that. Now, the wings are horizontal, and the missile rails have that slight downward angle, which, which is cool. Um, but when you look at it from the side, it's it's all... There's something wrong with it. And if you don't know what you're looking for, you might look at it and say, something looks a little bit wrong, but I can't put my finger on it. But that's what is wrong. It's that weird angle. Now, fixing that, well, it involves a lot of plastic surgery. That's my pun there. With the shaping over here. Or, and I've done this, uh, and I find this problem very heavy in Academy kits too, with cutting quite a bit off the nose gear so that it actually sits. Now, if we let the nose gear... And if you look there, all we do is let the nose gear fall into this hole a little bit. Even just that starts to make that picture look a little bit more correct. Um, you know, it, it takes more than that, but that's one thing. Now, another word on landing gear on this plane. These are some of the weakest, worst landing gear I've ever dealt with on any model kit ever. I have lost count of how many times these main gear have broken and I've had to repair them. And I, like, I do feel like I've earned uh, a structural engineering degree finding new ways to repair them. Uh, specifically, the part where I've really had to go at it and fix over and over and over is this part right here. It just, it's weak. And you can watch the wheels bow out over time. Uh, and 
but finally they just they very cleanly break though you get a break right about there and you know then you got to fix it um, there's only one point actual um, you know tab into slot point of contact which is right there there's a, a little post that goes into a hole and then basically on this point you're just gluing it to the surface over there these they, they don't match up with anything where they're supposed to connect you just got to sort of find a way to make them fit and same thing with these retraction pistons over there it's terrible the worst well i can't say worst aircraft landing gear but worst f-16 landing gear I've, I've ever dealt with and literally every single part of this uh these little braces here i've actually had to cut down and just glue to the surface they've broke everything here has broken uh multiple times in fact as it was sitting while I was editing the first part of, of this video, kind of telling the story, it, it broke to the point where I finally just drilled out and inserted some very thin steel wire. Um, I thought I had a piece of it. I don't. Uh, I actually drilled in and put a very thin piece of steel wire um, in in here, in each side, and I and, you know, and then fastened it all with super glue. And I hope that'll be the final solution there to keep that in. Um, and then as I was making those repairs. This entire thing, this whole thing split. So this comes as one piece. It's split there. And I mean, it's just been hell. And now I'll admit, I'm a bull in a china shop. I, I routinely break the little fiddly bits as I'm, as I'm finishing a model. In fact, I joke with my sons. I said, boys, I'm almost finished. Who wants to guess how many pieces I break as I'm uh, putting the last, you know, final touches on. But anyway. So, it, it, yeah, that's it. But the landing gears on this are terrible. And because it's such a, a cheap, poorly made kit, there's not a lot of companies. I can't think, you know, uh, I don't. I don't think anybody makes an aftermarket good um, landing gear set for it at all. Since we're on the underside anyway, the intake is. Uh, it's not even a two-piece intake where you have two sides that go into the the actual piece. It's one piece. Now there is a resin intake that you can get. But there's just, it's terrible in there. I did my best. Again, buyer did not want to spend any extra money. Um, did not want me to put in any extra work. Uh, wanted to minimize the hours and, and time spent on this. So there you go. There's no internal uh, engine really to speak of from the front view. There is, um, there's a, an exhaust and, you know, an afterburner piece that goes in the rear. But there's nothing in the front. Um, it is missing some uh, cooling scoops that go along the sides uh, a couple little pieces that go there very basic um, interior for your your gear bays um, whatever the kit itself gives you i mean no options to build anything besides of like i said before a very early model f16 um, you get early wheels no options for weighted wheels at all it is what it is um, you only get very early chaff and flare dispensers. If you really wanted to, like once again, if you're willing to put in the work, you could scribe out or you could, um, you know, make scratch build, cut out and scratch build uh, the two by um, ALE 47 dispenser if you wanted to. But, you know, that's that. No, no chance at all to position these uh, air brakes open. And they're very, they're very much larger, you know, chunky than they should be. And interesting, the horizontal stabilators come um, as part of the upper fuselage, um, and they're the angles are off. They're they're not at the same angle, and I don't mean in terms of pitch. I mean they're. I've I've spent a lot of time carefully straightening them out and making them um, match. But one is kind of relatively horizontal in line, and one is badly angled. So you have to fix that too. Um, a little bit of work to make these fuselage halves meet up. Um, the We already talked about the issues with the engine nozzles. Um, all of these static dischargers, I did replace. Um, and, you know, he, he said, I don't want any kind of aftermarket stuff. I don't want any scratch building. But the truth is they were too flimsy and thin and they were going to break. So I, I just did it. I made it out of, you know, and again, I, I don't charge for every little, I don't like serve a bill, an itemized bill, but... Um, I also, if my name's going to go on something, I have to produce a good piece of work. You know what I mean? So I made these out of styrene, and they're a little bit big to scale, but 
they're stable and they're going to stay on there. They're not going to break, and you can see that they're there. The ones that come on the kit are, are just a little bit too small and flimsy, and they're, they, they're, they don't all match. You know, some are a little bit bigger than, than others and stuff like that. Now, if we really want to nitpick and get into panel lines and everything, um, they're not 100% accurate, but they're good enough for, for a kit of this scale. Um, they re Like I said, they represent an F-16 to anybody besides those who really know. If you haven't either, um, you're, you're a noner, a noner is somebody that, well, it's an Air Force term, you know, a noner who has just studied up to become an expert, um, or, you, you know, you're not somebody who hasn't, like, actually served and you've been out on the flight line, you know, pilots, you, you've actually worked in air combat, you're not going to know what's wrong with these. Um, and it's probably the people that are going to take most offense are are those people that just like, you know, live in front of their computers with, with uh, hyper accurate specs of the F-16. They're good and they're good panel lines. They're nicely inscribed. They're, you know, some of the rivet detail is wacky, but they're nicely done. They take a wash well, you know, as you can see, the uh, in-flight refueling door is, it, it does not conform to any decal size. So forget about it. Just make, make your best with it. I have on the shelf right here, actually, just because I painted it up, um, I was going to weather it up and do some more. This is the GE engine, which besides, again, being very inaccurate in terms of the um, the feather count, and I don't know why there are these lines in the donut ring there, because there wouldn't be on the GE engine. It's not bad. And, you know, having an extra GE nozzle for a uh, project, now, you're normally not used to seeing it in that kind of... Uh, bronzish color normally it's more of a, a steel color but i just wanted to try something with some weathering powders and stuff um, not bad and again except you know it, except for the rivet counters it will pass nicely for a ge engine nozzle um, another pure horror show for this aircraft for this model is the cockpit absolutely terrible um, uh, you know i had mentioned before that the uh, the the actual panel lines and everything uh, for lack of a better word uh it, all the all the raised surfaces and everything the buttons and, and details and everything in the cockpit absolutely terrible the fit of the cockpit is absolutely terrible so i sanded it all the way sanded it all the way and what i did was i found some very very nicely and accurate detailed pictures of f-16 cockpits through every version on the internet and i found a, a block 30 cockpit and i printed it up um, and so that we could have some actual photorealistic F-16 controls, panels, and everything inside of our cockpit. And that actually worked out really well. And I don't think you're going to be able to see it on here with the canopy, which is another problem we're going to get to. Um, but so I was able to cut that de those decals up. They are applied where, where I could get them to accurately go inside the uh, cockpit, along the sides, you know, the control panel, and everything like that. You know, and I made the best of it. So yeah, I did the very best I could. I, I this this kit screams for an aftermarket set. The seat I did build from the kit, and because it was just so, I, I did some sanding and filling on that. And these seat belts you see here, uh, believe it or not, that is left over from the Trumpeter Mig Twenty Three. Um, I just adjusted them and folded them up and painted them and made them look something like an F-16 ACES-2 ejection seat harness. One of the things I really like on this one is the dressing on the HUD. Uh, this is a tip I picked up in a video, and I wish I could give credit. I want to give credit to where I learned this from, but I can't remember. That is nail film. Nail film is, and I have a piece over here I can show you. It's this very incredibly thin Mylar stuff. And what nail artists do is they cut it into little pieces. They put a, a clear layer on a nail and they put it on there and then they seal it with like another clear layer on top of it. And it comes in all sorts of colors and finishes. But this sort of pink greenish one is perfect for electronics, for HUDs, um, you know, seeker heads. They have all different colors. It's really cheap on Amazon too. It's like um, $9 for like 24 pieces. And it's a really nice effect on the HUD, and it's a great way to add a little bit of detail to uh, a place that needs some badly. The canopy is another problem. 
Um, it is a bubble canopy like an F-16 should have, but it's not what we call blown. Um, the F-16 should have much more of a, a bubble horizontally. The pilot in an F-16 should be able to lean over and look a little bit down over, over the edge of the cockpit. Now, it's going to be hard to see from this angle, but if you look at the Hasegawa canopy, it has, oops, it has that blown edge. You can feel it there, too, where it comes up and, and around to make it a real bubble, you know? It's the little kind of thing that you probably won't notice when it's sitting on a shelf, but it, it is necessary to be accurate. Getting the canopy to sit evenly, open like that, is another, you know, you, you need a team of engineers and computer software to figure it out. It doesn't like to sit properly in there. Um, it was uh, just, I, I'm not exaggerating, probably a 10-minute job to, to fit it and move side to side and rotate the plane around in every angle to make sure it was finally sitting like that. Now, the easiest solution is to just have it closed. But again, close, I wish I had pictures of it closed. It looks ridiculously awkward when it's closed because you have this terrible gap between the uh, the rear here, the rail um, at the at the back of the canopy there, and the front of the rear portion, and it just doesn't. You, it's there's so much. I would I would spend so much time filling and then sanding and then rescribing new lines around where this canopy goes. The scoop over here, the ram air cooling scoop on the base of the tail. By the way, I had mentioned before. So base of the tail. Um, a C model, to know a C model when you see it. So it's longer than the A model, but this extra UHF aerial, so the F-16A had only one VHF radio and one UHF radio. The VHF is used to speak interflight between aircraft uh, in the formation. The UHF can also be used for that, um, but the UHF is a longer range communication and most importantly, can be used to talk to the ground controllers, directing them through their missions. Um, that's a whole nother video. The C model incorporated an extra UHF radio, and that's what that antenna is for. So now they had a UHF radio to talk to their ground controllers, a UHF radio that they could dedicate for air-to-air -air communication, and they still had their VHF, which for what we call interflight, which the pilots thought that we on the ground, us controllers, couldn't hear what they were saying. Uh, but guess what? We have VHF radios too, and yeah, we can. But anyway... Uh, that's one great way to tell a C model from A models, is that extended base of the tail with that UHF aerial. Um, one of the only A models that has not been modernized to carry an extra UHF um, radio is the F-16A ADF or ADV, the air defense variant, and it is going to have those big strakes on the base of the tail because it locates its extra radio gear inside the base of the tail. Uh, and in order to accommodate that, they moved some of the actuators for stuff inside the tail to those large strikes. Anyway, the more you know. So to outfit this F-16, because, you know, to have an F-16 with nothing on the wingtips is a crime. By the way, these missile rails are wrong. We talked about that when we were going through the parts of the kit. Um, now, to have missiles on a modern US F-16, you have something called the LAU-129 launch rail, which looks like this. These are the incorrect launch rails for any um, C model F-16 on the wingtips. Uh, once upon a time, we carried sidewinders on the wingtips, and the launch rails look like this. The LAU 129s allow for the use of the AIM-120 and the sidewinder. Now, there's different electrical hookups and different cooling hookups because uh, the sidewinders actually have um, different electronics. They have uh, modern sidewinders have cooled seekers and things like that. You need the 129 launch rails to provide all the adaptions and hookups for the modern missiles. And that's why you'll see these on the wingtips instead of these. Now, you might still see these under the wings occasionally in older jets, but you'll probably also see these under the wings because these are the multi-use launchers. Um, these come molded on. Uh, you can't do anything with them. So you would have to actually cut these off, source these in another kit, or uh, this one comes from a Hasegawa weapon set, so you know you can find them somewhere, and replace them if you want it to be super accurate. Uh, 
I have a Sidewinder, you know, lowdown anyway. Um, what would be accurate for this particular aircraft at Nellis, we have some options. Um, this is not a, you know, a lot of people will call it a dummy round or a captive round. Um, this is a little bit different. So when you see a, a blue missile tube uh, Sidewinder, this is a ballasted round. That's a little bit different than a captive air training round. Um, and the whole difference is we don't need to get in now. But I went with a, a ballasted AIM-9, and on the other side, we've got an AMD, which is uh, not the same thing as an ACM iPod. A little bit different, but everybody puts an ACM iPod on there. Uh, an ACM iPod is only used when you are engaging in mock aerial combat. I thought it would be nice to put the AMD pod on, which has some other uses too, which that's a whole other video. This came from... Uh, where did this come from? I can't think of what kit this missile came from right now. Neither of these missiles came from the kit because the missiles in the kit suck. So I decided, oh, this came from the Hasegawa F-16C because even that kit, while, while the F-16 is, is much more accurate, um, their weapons are very basic. Uh, you have to buy the Hasegawa weapon set to get really good weapons. Um, so this came from... Huh... I'm sorry, I just can't remember right now. I know that this came from... Um, they they both came from Hasegawa sets, now that I think about it. Okay, so this came from the Hasegawa um, F-16C kit, and this came from a uh, Hasegawa F-16 weapon set, uh, and it was modified. I removed the forward fins and, and did some other stuff to turn it into an AMD pod, and that is just an AIM-9, and I actually, well, I sanded off some of the things from the, the rear fins that are for stabilization and maneuvering, because obviously it's not going anywhere, and turn it into a ballasted round on there. As for the markings, the one, you know, I, I really wanted to hand over the jet that the customer wanted, because I had, I had, you know, that's the whole point. He he wanted the shark markings. And there's a couple places you can find them. Two Bobs, obviously two Bobs decals are fantastic. Um, bullseye decals I had never tried before. Um, I bought them from Sprue Brothers, I believe. Um, so I decided to give this set a try and I was very happy with the decals, but they did forget some cool things that came in the two Bob set. So I just made myself some masks for it. The two Bob set comes with vinyl masks for this part on the tail and these part on the wings. And they just represent some dielectric panels that you'll find on the Russian jets. Nice, easy color call outs on there. Up, down. Yeah. And then, of course, all the stenciling and that worked really well. But, you know, unfortunately, because of the weird sit of the plane, if you're just looking at it, it sort of makes the tail decals look like they're slanted down. You know, if you actually have a plane that sits level, they look great. Um, that's very, very frustrating for me. But what can I do? It is, it is working with the lines on the plane. Decals were really, really good, though, and everything. And then I used... Uh, some uh, green brown wash which worked really well for both of the colors involved oh yeah i also um from the hasegawa weapon set i used the alq 188 pod because if you're gonna have an aggressor flying around they're gonna carry an alq 188 you uh, might see some old pictures of aggressors with these little chin pods um, they don't they haven't flown with them much since 2009 so i you know um, you can make your choice whether or not you want to fly with them but you can see some, some color differences. I did some pre-shading um, and, and panel shading all throughout with different colors. And, you know, it, the lighting for the video is not great. But, I you know, the thing was I knew that I had to make this thing at least look good um, since there were so many problems with the physical construction of it. And, and that's what I did. I did my best to make it look good. When it was all said and done... I, I contacted the buyer, I sent him pictures, and in the email, I pointed out all of the flaws with the kit, and I drew his attention to all of the problems in it, and I said, these are issues I want you to be aware of, and please look hard, and you know, he, this is the frustrating part, so when you, when you work for commission, when you make money on models, when you take commissions, the problem is you don't get to build what you want, you build what the customer wants, and you know, so... 
we'll back up to when I said the customer isn't always right. Well, the customer can be right, but the customer isn't always correct, you know? So he was upset. And he said, but why didn't you fix this? Why didn't you fix this? And I said, well, you said you didn't want to spend any of, you know, you wanted a very base price. You didn't want to, you know, be scammed into aftermarket this. You didn't want the blah, blah, blah. And he said, well, I didn't realize that it meant, you know, this wasn't going to get taken care of. And I didn't realize that a bad cockpit couldn't be, you know, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, well, you insisted on using this kit. And I referenced emails where I referenced, you know, we can get a much better result with this kit, this kit, this kit. Uh, you know, I recommended that we do this and this and this, and I referenced, and he's like, well, I, th I thought you were trying to upcharge me. I didn't realize it was going to make a better plane. And so that's when my head popped like a piece of popcorn. <laughs> and he just didn't answer him for a day. And I got back to him, and I said, here's what I'm willing to do. I will reimburse you. I understand there was a miscommunication. I will reimburse you for the price that you paid for this kit, for this model kit. I will even pay for the shipping. If you want to, if you want to redo this project with a higher quality kit, and and I will not charge you for anything we did with this thing. I will attempt to either I'll either put it on a shelf, I will possibly use it as a shooting target. I might let my dog chew on it. Or maybe I'll try to sell it on the secondary market. I'll throw it up on eBay and see if I can make some money on it to recover something myself. Um, and we can buy, you know, you we can we can start a new project with a good kit, possibly some aftermarket accessories, and start again to make a better quality. You know, if you if that's what you want. <laughs> and the guy, then we had. I don't like talking to people on the phone because you know I don't know if I've I've said this on my other channel. I ha I have anxiety issues. So we then talked on the phone and we had a whole conversation with me explaining certain aspects of, of model building and, and, you know, aftermarket kits are made because they make models better. It's not just designed to make a model more expensive. And, you know, the guy asks me, so why don't they just, why don't the model companies just make the kits with this stuff? And I said, because it's a business. It's, you know, it's, you know, think of any, any, any industry where they sell you a base product and then they offer you accessories. That, that's why. And, you know, some people are okay with, he's like, well, I really want this to impress people. I want it to, you know, blah, blah, blah. Then you, that's why, that's why they sell the, the accessories. Because there are some people who are okay with the very base model on the shelf. And that's fine. There are some people who really want the impressive thing on the shelf. And they want people to look at it. And that's fine too. So. The thing is, I have I have a lot of problem with anything that's going to have my name attached to it going out in anything less than the very best condition I can send it. And so what I am going to do to try to recover a little bit of money from the time and everything and supplies lost is I am going to put it on eBay, but I'm going to put a big disclaimer that, listen, this is a, this is a, you know, this is a, like a factory quotes, factory second condition model. It is not the best work possible, but if you want it just for a wall display, go for it, you know, because um, maybe then I can make a little bit of money back since I'm now buying the kit and the decals from the guy. I felt bad for the guy in the end. I think he's an older guy. Um, I don't think, I really don't think he understood the intent of, of spending money, more money on a better kit. I really think he did believe that every model kit was the same. And some were just more expensive because they were ripping you off. I don't know. I don't know. I don't think he's ever built a model himself a day in his life. But um, wrapping this all up, I, you know, I want to be proud of every model I produce, as does any model maker. And um, one of the biggest thrills in my life was when I actually went to see one of my works on display. And uh, it was that kind of school kid excitement wanting to like jump up and down and flag down anybody walking by and be like hey hey yo yo I made that that's mine here look at my ID look at my name that's me that's mine I built that you know um, and it kills me to have to produce anything less than my best work at any given point so people ask me a lot they're like wow that's so cool that you can get paid to build a model and I'm like well you know they always say anytime your hobby becomes work it's not fun anymore and there are frustrating times when you get a commission and um, 
you know, it's a lot less fun when you're building something you don't want to build. When you're when you're building the project you want to build, of course it's awesome. Of course it's fun because your heart's in it. It's what you want to do. So always keep that in mind when you're saying, boy, I wish I could just get paid to do this stuff. So there's the saga of this plane, the cautionary tale. Thank you so much, guys, for sitting through this. I hope uh, maybe I've uh, shown you something cool in this video at least showing you some cool things about this horrendous kit. <laughs> Maybe giving you some tips on, on how, to, how to put in the time and make something cool out of it. Um, or maybe just been a little bit entertaining. And for all you folks out there doing your own, keep building them, build them well. And we'll be back with another project really soon.